Hey, it's The Current, another virtual session. I'm Jill Riley, and I'm very excited to be joined by our guest today. And uh, Julian Baker is here. We're having a face-to-face via Zoom, of course, on the radio. You can just hear our voices. Um, But um, this is exciting because, you know, we've been talking about new music for the year 2021 and these kind of highly anticipated records. And Julian Baker, new record coming out Friday, February 26th, third studio album called Little Oblivions. And we're looking forward to hearing the whole thing. Julian, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Not bad. Uh, Great to be talking to you. It's always nice when I can, can, you know, just to stay connected with um, musicians. We can't do traditional in studios. Well, you know that because you can't go on tour right now. So this is kind of a nice way to to get the info on what to expect from you. And um, so Little Oblivions, I guess just to jump in, when did you start working on the record? I started working on the record... I guess I had collected songs and been writing songs, but I made the first round of demos in January 2019. And then I worked, like, I would go down to Memphis or go to a studio here um, to tinker with the songs over the course of that entire year. And then uh, in the beginning of 2020, uh, made all the final re-recordings and did all the I believe the term is sweetening, but I prefer... Ah, I haven't heard that term before. Yeah, (laughs) I don't know. That's what I got taught in when I was briefly an audio major. That was one of my vocabulary words. And then I was just like, what am I doing here? But no shade. (laughs) No shade. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So So, you uh, said, um, you know, going to Memphis and then you said here. Now, is are you in Nashville? Yeah, I, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't give you any context for that. Yes, I'm no, that's here okay. in Nashville. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've been here. I was up here for school. I mean, I was living up here, and then I stayed up here to go to school at Middle Tennessee. And then shortly after I graduated, uh, quarantine began. So I just chose to shelter in place here rather than try to move during the craziness. So you grew up in Tennessee, right? But you, you didn't grow up in not Nashville proper. Where, where did you grow up in Tennessee? I grew up in Memphis. Yeah. I oh, you did in Memphis. Memphis. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where I spent my entire childhood, basically. I've never been to Memphis. What is it like there? What's it like to grow up there? Wow. Um, I love Memphis. Like, I think people from Memphis have a, an exaggerated loyalty to the city because at least during the time... I was there and when I was getting into music and going to local shows and playing in bands, it always felt like there was a semi-hostile, semi-funny sibling rivalry between Nashville and Memphis just because Memphis, while it has a super rich cultural, like a music history about it, I think that for some reason, it was a city that often got skipped, you know? I remember we used to have to drive to St. Louis or Nashville or Atlanta to see big tours because we were like a B or C city. <laughs> um, but I think that that really engendered in me a sense of making music cooperatively, uh, hmm. just out of a sense of necessity, you know? when when resources aren't being funneled to you because your town is a particularly lucrative place to play or a particularly like significant music business hub, um, then you end up having to make do with the resources that are available just in your local community. And I think that bred a real reliance on other people and uh, a conceptualization of music that is more communal than individual yeah I think I think people listening in Minnesota right now maybe can relate to that especially you know any musician because you know Minneapolis St. Paul is just considered this flyover country right and so Mm -hmm. and while big artists tour through Minneapolis we can get skipped in the same way that Memphis could get skipped over and so I think I kind of I really get what you're talking about with that kind of that communal kind of supportive like you know we're we're kind of it's almost like you're it's, it's insular. It's insular yeah. in a way. And I mean, I've, I 
it's crazy because I, we played there. We've played there several times, and I always have such a great time in Minneapolis. And of course, like you know, I've been to your radio station before, and I there's a lot of lore around Minneapolis. I don't know with Prince and um, all these various musicians, and I I feel like cities like that and Detroit is another one that I feel like a uh, a cultural kinship to because they are cities that exist right outside of the categorization of like a Chicago or like New York or um, something like that. It's uh, and it's a place that in being looked over has carved out a very special identity for itself. So, yeah, I get that. I'm talking with Julian Baker here on The Current. The new record, Little Oblivions, is on the way. And so it, is this the kind of record where, you know, you, you wrote it, you recorded it, you sweetened it, and then did you have to just kind of sit on it for a while because of the pandemic? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's always uh, a difficult thing to create a record and have it done and then turn it into the label and wait while the whole like, ro- rollout process is happening but um yeah it seemed especially tedious this time because i wasn't touring i wasn't playing new songs at shows um and yeah i don't know but maybe maybe it's been good to have time just to focus on the content of the record and sort of mine through the details of it so that I can have a more cohesive idea of how to talk about it. You know, I feel like there's so many, like this press cycle is interesting because usually this would be overlapping with tour and travel and the sort of grind of doing my job as a performer while promoting my music as a musician and I've been fortunate enough to have time at home where I can soak into the music and the process of creation and uh, think about it hopefully and be a little bit more articulate about it. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I won't say who it was, but I, I had a musician in the studio once and we were talking specifically about the songs on the record. And she was having a really hard time kind of articulating what the music was about because it was so personal. And she was kind of a she was kind of tiptoeing, like mm-hmm. tiptoeing around what the song was actually about. And when we finished, she pulled me aside and said, I don't know why I couldn't talk about my own music. I have to really think about that. And so I just think that's interesting that you get so caught up in the, okay, we're done with the record. Now we have to tour. And now I have to run around to, you know, various places to promote this thing that even though you've been able to process, you know, your life experiences that have gone into the song, but then to process how to talk about them i mean I, I i love that you brought that up right there yeah no and it's very interesting i mean i i think so much about this because i want to be able to speak about my music in an articulate way but it is very challenging when you create something that is that has this level of emotional immediacy when you create it it's an outpouring of your thoughts or a medium that helps you process events in your own life. And then it is turned so quickly into, it's like very quickly commodified in the public, uh, in like the public sphere. And then you have to figure out how to negotiate the boundaries between like what, like what you're comfortable talking about. Because as you say, like if this artist wrote extremely personal things, I'm sure that, she and I feel the same way. That is, mm-hmm. sometimes I, f- you know, I find myself tiptoeing around things or doing a whole bunch of verbal ap- acrobatics to avoid saying something that I'm sensitive about, because it is a lot to disclose with full honesty um, your feelings about songs. You know, that's sort of it's already difficult enough to write the songs themselves, um, and it's hard. You know, I think for me talking about my songs is always as much of a learning process 
as writing them. I feel like in the discourse that ends up evolving around them in interviews and stuff, I, I learn or am revealed more things about my, my motivation or my mentality uh, around a song than I even was aware of when I wrote it, you know? Yeah. Well, it's almost like reading a book for the third or fourth time or watching yeah. a movie for the third or fourth time, and then you realize that there was something about it that you maybe you missed yeah. the first time around. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting to hear how that can be revealed. And, you know, there are certain artists that will release a song and say, eh, now it's up to you to interpret it, because, because there you go. There it is. It's out there. But I think I even I often find myself wanting to know more or, you know, people that are super fans of, you know, any songwriter or you in particular saying maybe they relate to it so much that they want to know. They want to know the meaning because they want to feel like, <laughs> like, am I relating to this? Like, is this person going through the same thing as me? Yeah. And I, it's interesting because that's also a, a balance that's difficult to strike as a musician talking about her own work. Uh, me. I don't know why I just was speaking in the third person. But um, <laughs> I like, because there is a level, I think, of disclosing so much in the interest of endearing people to your music with this idea of like emotional capital like giving away this thing that um makes your music more readily understood by people who listen to it but there i think that there has to be at least a little bit of mutability around songs that way people can interpret them in the ways that they need you know, I don't want to be so literal and explicit about the way I talk about my songs that they stop pertaining to anybody else's story. Um, and you like know, you can't relate to this song unless X, Y, or Z is happening. Yeah, to you. or right, like yeah. yeah, like now I've been so like so explicit about whatever event you know precipitated this song that people imagine it as a like a vignette in the story of my life as a performer um i think the whole point of making music and leaving things unsaid or saying things in a metaphorical or representative sense is to make the like to allow them to be grafted onto another person's lived experience um or at least that's just how i feel <laughs> that's how i make myself comfortable with being scene like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Sure. I'm talking with Julian Baker, a virtual session here on The Current. Now, with all of that said, with that conversation that we just had, sure. um, I, I would like to talk about the song Faith Healer a little bit here, because this is the one that we've been playing here on The Current. And I think just like to start on a very basic level, um, you know, when did you get into the studio? What studio did you go to to record this? Oh, man. So I originally recorded it at the home of my friend Colin Pastor here in Nashville, and we recorded it in a much, much different arrangement and worked with that demo version at a studio here called Trace Horse, um, run by a couple of my friends. And then I we t like when I rewrote the song in Memphis, that's what ended up becoming the version that was on the record. I'm glad I did because I there was something I was super attached to the lyrics, but I just felt like the arrangement was not good. <laughs> so I don't know. That's so much so much of the job of a musician is just tinkering patiently, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about rewriting, I mean, you're talking about the arrangement, not specifically about the lyrics, because you wanted to keep the lyrics. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So like most. I feel like most of the changes that I will want to make with songs are arrangement based. I, every once in a while I'll find like two half songs that have a similar theme that I'll try to cobble together, but almost inevitably those sound, you can hear the disjuncture. So I don't like to do that if I can avoid it. Um, but who knows? Songwriting is a evolving practice. So I think it's really interesting when artists will you know, just kind of for their own sake, they'll take a slow song and kind of flip it into a fast song or take a fast song and just try it out as a slow song. And that's something that we, I think, just as the people who, you know, listen to the end product, 
you know, I don't think at times we realize just how much goes into it that we don't know about. Sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is because we either think of music in the in the pop realm or in the massive like artists that are massive, like, I don't know, um, Adele or something like we think that there is a whole lot of intricate song building that goes in from like talking heads that craft a song and then use a persona or a voice to bring that into the world or we think that on the other hand songs are just written with this sort of genius revelation (laughs) to just know what to write and that's not necessarily true it's just like everything else where it just takes daily practice I you know daily sitting down daily with your instrument and like re working the same ideas sometimes it's a little bit tedious but ultimately you know helpful I think well the song faith healer um so since you have had some time to sit down and think about how you want to talk about this one um you know did you have some kind of like revelation about the lyrics or where were you at you know where were you at in your life at the time what was the motivation for it inspiration i like the word inspiration a little bit better yeah okay yeah okay i see how those are different um i started writing the song specifically like pertaining to substances just kind of like i don't know a a requiem for the availability of immediate relief through uh drugs and alcohol and kind of a song about how sobriety and recovery is an ongoing process. Uh, it's not something that's achieved once and for all. Um, but then I started looking at the other things in my life. You know, over the course of the last couple years, I've been dismantling a lot of ways that I thought about the world and seeing that it's not only the very literal uh context of drugs and alcohol that we can become uh, unhealthily entrenched in. There's all sorts of things, uh, religious ideologies, political ideologies, obsessive behaviors, um, you know, doing anything compulsively, like all, all of those behaviors are just trying to assuage anxiety. And People will go to great lengths and even believe things contrary to the rational in order to find relief from suffering. Mm-hmm. Because life is painful and people need those things. And it's just interesting how many different m- manifestations that can have. You know, it can be somebody selling you anointed oil, <laughs> it can be. <laughs> A politician telling you, if you just vote for me, then I'll fix all your problems. Uh, Any kind of figurehead. uh, You know, we worship so many different things in an obsessive way. And, uh, yeah, it was painful for me to realize that all of those things are the same level of just, like, incapacitating even though it's really easy to condemn drugs and edify religion they're serving the same purpose and they have to be evaluated in the same way um yeah i don't know (laughs) sorry that's a really dark thought but true and i think you know necessary for people to reflect on maybe Mm -hmm. no i like um dark thoughts welcome to my head i just yeah, for real <laughs> i tend to filter too many of them out before i speak but yeah. um but th- but thank you for that insight and just kind of you know kind of getting behind the story of of faith healer i'm talking with julian baker new record little oblivions is on the way friday february 26th and so we've been playing faith healer and i know that you shared another song called favor which uh, reunited you with some of your uh, collaborators from uh, Boy Genius, Phoebe Bridgers and Lucy Dacus. So uh, do you want to talk about that song a little bit, about Favor and and recording with them? Yeah, sure. Um, we all happened to be in Nashville uh, in 2019, middle of 2019. Lucy was down here making some recordings and Phoebe was here and we all took the opportunity since we had missed 
playing and singing with each other to uh, guest in, you know, sit in on each other's songs, and it was really nice. Um, but yeah, this one, this one is like very explicitly dark, like even for me. But I, I like it. I also thought I was I was not sold on this one at first because I thought the drum riff in the beginning sounded like a Linkin Park song. But <laughs> <laughs> that shuffle is a little like the high processed shuffle snare pattern. And I was like, Oh my god, I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can hear your it description. now. Yeah. You're like, yeah, this is like a break beat from a new metal song. That's all I can think of. But I don't know. Yeah. Um hey, as far as, you know, um for for anyone Maybe you just know it's your music or has heard uh, a Boy Genius song. Just a little background on how did that collaboration originally come about? Uh, Between me, Phoebe, and Lucy, uh, Mm -hmm. we were all booked on a tour together. Like, we had met and interacted all in our disparate ways throughout all the tour bidding that we did. Um, Mm -hmm. But... Uh, we got booked on this tour together, like a three band bill and had the idea to make, I believe at first we just thought we were going to make maybe like a little 45, like a little seven inch with a, uh, with an A and a B side, just something fun uh, collaboration for the tour. And then when we all met up to write, we ended up just making far much more material than that <laughs> and, uh, that's usually how it goes i guess yeah yeah, yeah which was it, you know it's a welcome surprise to find that you have undiscovered musical chemistry with you know these people that i i had respected and admired and cherished as friends already before um so yeah it's just it was born in a very natural way i think um yeah one of the yeah, feels very natural. I'm talking with Julian Baker. Little Oblivions due out Friday, February 26th. I'm sure you're really happy to just to get this record out and and have it see the light of day already. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, and it also feels like once the record is out as a collection of work, then I can sort of relinquish my need or like <laughs> the uh, the expectation to do all the sense making of the record uh, via interviews and also it's like it's always so interesting to see which songs people like as singles um, to me I don't think it makes much of a difference but yeah I wonder what the conceptualization of the record will be because of the chosen songs and what people will think of it but I think it'll just feel fulfilling for me to put out this record it's very different and I don't know it's it's empowering for me to make such a change it seems drastic to me but to other people it's like nah this is just the this is how Julian sounds now there's just drums um Mm -hmm. but yeah personally it feels significant to me to just be able to put something out into the world that I'm really proud of and fulfilled by um yeah and to be able to release it now as as the whole you know yeah it, like totally so people can listen to it in it's i guess as one piece instead of one single sure. <laughs> like a piece of the piece yeah, you know totally yeah uh julian baker virtual session here on the current uh thank you so much for checking in with the current and um say hi to nashville for me it's been a long time since i've been there it's every time i go back it's it's like a different city. I don't know. And they, yeah, I have Memphis on the list because I have this feeling and you've lived in both. So maybe you can tell me that have things changed less in Memphis? Yes. Okay. hundred percent. They're still changing. Like there's still, well, I don't even want to get into the like gentrification discussion, but there's still some of that happening. But Memphis, I think has retained uh, an individual character more than Nashville has been able to to no no fault of Nashville. I don't know why mm-hmm. I'm personifying a city like I'm going to offend the entity that is Nashville. But um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you should give it a visit. Give it a visit. I will. I will. And it makes sense. It's almost like you're talking about the spirit of the city. You yeah, know? totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the record. Uh, can't wait till you can get out and tour again. People are either. People are excited. Right. Your I think your your fans and audiences are 
she's gonna be eventually wigging out <laughs> awesome <laughs> or we can I get hope together so. to, you know we can out. get together as a group yes so um all right well take care thank you julian yeah, thank you take so care much. have a great day you too Jill. all right